Sam. Hi. Welcome to the Hi. No, welcome to the San Juan Islands Museum of Art. I'm only going to say that once, the San Juan Islands Museum of Art. Okay. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Welcome, though. Thank you very much for having me. It's yeah. great to be here. So we're going to talk about these pieces first, and then we're going to uh, quickly move into the other gallery and, and talk about um, the uh, analog pieces. Yeah. Can I say that? Well, these are actually analog pieces, whereas those are digital prints okay. of analog right. images. We spoke about that together last, yeah. last night. Yeah, that's right. So, so the interesting thing, um, I think when people look at this, what do you want them to see? Well, I don't know if there's anything too particular uh, that I want them to see beyond what's in the images. You know, I think that they have these, you know, circular forms that let people's imagination wander, if you will. Um, a lot of people see jellyfish. Not at all my intention, but I love it, and I totally see why. I think I and a lot of people also see a cosmic kind of outer space-ness from the pictures, which I really like because they're actually from a much smaller uh, place instead of outer space. They're actually uh, so small we can't see these things with our human eyes, but photography kind of reveals them to us. And so when you were um, thinking about this project, what is it that you wanted to convey? Initially, I was really interested to see if I could photograph this sculptural form of water in the air and thinking it might uh, distort what's ever behind it. So I ended up stumbling into these orbs and strange forms that photography uh, picks up, that the medium picks up. So I think I want to convey to viewers with a lot of my work that photography has an intrinsic ability to reveal and to uncover things that we sometimes, in this case, cannot see. So uh, it kind of gives us access to a visual world that's beyond our own perceptions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, these are so different. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, I guess I'm, I'm trying to uh, kind of look at this series, mm -hmm. and then, of course, the, the other series, the, the uh, colors, I'm just going to call it playtime. There we go, so yeah. I love that word, playtime, because yeah. they do look very, very playful. Yeah, and that comes from what I'm doing. You know, I, I realized I was playing a lot in the studio and in the dark room making them, yeah. and that they had a kind of playful um, feeling to them for lots of people. Uh, but even that was, it was more of an intuitive moment, where previous to playtime, I was naming a lot of my pictures just by sounds that came out of my mouth. Some of it was words, some of, the, of it wasn't. Mm -hmm. And that's how the Playtime title came. Once I started thinking about it and thinking about the action of play, it, it fit so nicely. But it wasn't a, you know, I wasn't sitting there trying to conceptually figure it out. It was more of this kind of primitive uh, moment. Let's go ahead and show the viewers yeah. exactly what we're talking about. That's a great idea. Okay. Great. Playtime. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, tell us a little bit about these, and not just the process, but yeah. I, I really want to know, um, and I think maybe the viewers as well. They want to know the inspiration here. Yeah. And, yeah. Please. So, um, what you're looking at are photographs of other photographs. I make all these prints in the dark room just using light and the paper. I kind of paint with light or draw with light on the paper. Uh, historically, it's a kind of way of using photography that's always been done, but not always very popular or well understood as photographs. I bring them to my studio and I photograph these prints. I make multiple exposure photographs. So the colors of the prints, the forms of them, they all mix inside the camera. So that's, that's what you're looking at. I, as I mentioned, I realized I was really playing a lot with the, in, compositionally, in the dark room and in the studio. 
And as well, it, it was so much that to me it's akin to the way we talk about musicians and playing their instruments. We use that as part of our language when we talk about music so naturally. And so I kind of hope, I hope these images convey that plays a, a really natural and intrinsic part of photography as well. As we mentioned back there, I think lots of people kind of get this sense of playfulness within the images, which I really like. I think that's kind of the, maybe one of the goals, I guess, of this series. And to show that there's a correlation between photography and music, and especially when I'm using a very photographic, you know, photographs of photographs, using films in the dark room, in these very photographic ways, we can see it very, very similar to, to music, right? Just like how recorded music, we listen to these interactions of recordings of sound. I think a lot about photography as light recording, and therefore I'm doing a very similar thing. Playing my instruments, the camera, the lights and uh, the boundaries of the film, I'm also making this dense, layered mixture of recordings, but instead of sound, I mix recordings of light. And less color. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that to me is a little bit like melody, trying to find a palette where things relate to each other in, in this kind of uh, magical way and kind of work off one another. So last night I asked you, do you listen to music while you're doing this? And I, I think you said no. Well, I, I started to, uh -huh. but then as the series progressed and I was able to use my own studio, use large format film, so as opposed to roll film, you use one sheet at a time, going very, very slowly, also was when I started to make this connection to music, I realized I was getting distracted and I need to really kind of it was a, it's a really cool moment where I kind of hit pause and it's silent and I'm just there looking at it until something clicks intuitively. So I do and I don't, but uh, to, it's important to have it silence, I think, at times. Uh, so uh, I'd like to deconstruct this. Yeah. I'd like to just look at this and, you know, so up close it is the imagery that the, the eye wanders around do you look do you look at when you're making those pieces and putting them together mm -hmm. do you look at composition yeah so as i mentioned using large format film and being in my own studio yeah. this allows me to really take my time and so you know i'm doing different arrangements in front of the camera photographing and then on the same piece of film, a different arrangement, photograph again. So I am very slowly and cautiously going through and looking at the, looking through the camera and okay, this part is good, but this corner is kind of weak. And because it's multiple exposure, I, I have an idea of this. So let me put something in this side that comes through here. Uh, you know, I know these things are going to come that way. So maybe this color in the next one. So it's, it's a lot more like painting or music in that slow compositional sense, as opposed to going outside and photographing the world, something that's already out there. I'm really kind of constructing it from the ground up because again, all, all the prints you see that I'm working with in my studio, I have to first make those in the dark room. So to really, it's a cool process because, like I said, it's kind of opposite from what we often think about in terms of photography out in the world. And yet it is so photographic. I'm using darkroom paper, photographing it. It's kind of like as much of a you know, photography as you can get, I think. And, and also, it's very painterly. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think with this particular piece, uh, we haven't talked about, but this particular piece, it is uh, the uh, depth that you're able to achieve here, mm -hmm. which I think I mentioned last night, is in remarkable. Oh, great. Uh, knowing uh, a lot about photography, um, that the depth here is, is quite remarkable. Oh, and thank I think you. These are, these are um, you said these are, what type of printing? It, ink, inkjet prints. So they do go through a kind of digital process at the end, uh -huh. but it's scanning the film, 
giving a little bit of uh, oomph to the image in Photoshop and then hitting print. If you look at the film, you would see you would see this. And these ones are on slide film, so it's not even a negative. It's a positive image. Oh. I think all of them except for that were on slide film. So you do actually just see this when you look at the film. I see. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess just a follow-up question. Uh, when people look at your work, what do you want them to take away? Well, I... In, with this body of work, I want them to get this playful sense and, and an idea that photography can be a lot more than just pointing a camera out in the world and that we can use, you know, I think about play as the motion, the kind of free-flowing activity someone does within a set of rules, whether it's a photograph, whether it's a piece of music someone's trying to make, but even elsewhere in life when we're trying to solve problems, when we, when we come up to uncertainty, uh, when you can feel more comfortable using play and, and uh, in appropriate ways, I think it's a really useful tool to, uh, to have. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's really great to be here. Yeah, it's really wonderful to, for you to be included in yeah. Oh, one other element that I wanted to ask you about, and it was, I, I saw um, on the internet, Life Framers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Could you just tell, just a few I, I, I'm, I'm very that happy to. The website is very cool. Yes, me. it is very cool. Yeah. And it's a great, uh, if there's any young people watching this, there's a great kind of story in that. Uh -huh. So I was selected in September of 20, of last year. Uh -huh. Uh, as second place in their monthly competitions. This one was color, and I was selected by Damarie Samo, and she's a curator of photography at Centre Papandou in Paris. Mm -hmm. So a very prolific uh, curator. And being in the second place, I get to be part of their traveling exhibition that's going on right now. The image that selected was number 29. Uh, just on that wall. Yeah. It was in Barcelona, Johannesburg, and it'll be in Bloomington, Indiana uh, in the fall of this year. So if there's any young people watching, the great kind of message with Life Framer for me was I had s submitted these exact pictures, I think it was five times. And for their monthly competitions, they select 18 photographers. So five times, I didn't get the top 18. But each monthly competition, the, the judge, the jury changes. So all of a sudden, there was that you know, right judge for my work. And I went from not getting it into the top 18 with the exact same pictures to second. So if there's any young people watching, sometimes you really do just have to submit, submit, submit. Try, try again. Try, try again, especially if you know that, oh, it's a rotating jury. It's not going to be the same people looking at my pictures. And uh, yeah, then you get, you know, thank goodness I did because yeah. now I, uh, it gets to go kind of all over the world for, for a bit, which is a big privilege, a big honor. Great. Great. Thanks. Well, thanks so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Yeah. Okay, so th this green line thing, so this was made in the studio, I'm like, so all these prints are glossy, so they have this really smooth, like, this very like reflective surface, if that makes sense, yeah, yeah. glossy, so I can shine, this is actually me shining a light on my phone off of one of the prints, and it casts this pattern onto, onto other ones, uh, you can see some down in this one here, I, I can show you. But it, it, there's like these triangles, these green triangles that are like repeating, and that's what that's so happening. This is the light from your phone. Being reflected like off of a print surface. onto another print. How did you know it would do that? That's, I mean, so that's what I mean with like using play okay. and use, going into the studio, not really having any plan per se, yeah. but playing around. Like I said, sometimes I got to cut the music and really focus my eye. Yeah and see what intuitively grabs me. And then I know I can use this in the composition in some way. It's a similar thing with these. You know, it kind of looks like a lo reflections off aluminum, especially here. All that is is just like reflections of other prints on a glossy surface. I love to have this liquidy look to it, which is interesting, I think, in a photographic.
that looks just otherworldly. Like yeah. It's floated in from the cosmos. That's yeah. That's a cosmic scene, you know, yeah. it's like, like where stars are born in there. Yes. It just sits there. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm glad. Joanna, thank you for joining uh, beautiful Salt Spring uh, ex exhibition. Uh, we want to hear all about what it is that, you know, we're standing in front of these uh, felt pieces. And can you tell us just briefly the name of the pieces or the, the, the series that you're working with? Um, and then maybe talk to us a little bit about what it was that was going through your mind when you were uh, formulating these, these ideas here. Yes, definitely. First, thank you for letting me be here. It's, it's wonderful. So these three pieces of armor are part of a series. Uh, I've been making armor for about 20 years. And this was one of the first pieces that I made. It is, in fact, 20 years old. The others are newer. There's two more pieces in the other gallery. I just really like the form of armor to work with. Because for a lot of reasons, it suggests the body, which I find um, fascinating. And I also have seen how people looking at them respond, too, because we can relate to things that we can wear. Um, I also like playing with the idea of armor because it's usually hard and cold and very protective. Now, textiles can provide uh, protection and comfort, but they're very soft. So you get that lovely juxtaposition, and I, I like working with that. Now, the armor comes from two different sort of installations that I've been working on. One is called Darwin's Wardrobe, and the idea behind that is if Darwin was still traveling, these are pieces that he might have in his collection to take home, but they document lost worlds rather than found worlds. So it's all about what, what's disappearing, what, what beautiful things we're losing, sometimes often without even being aware that they exist in the first place. And then the other series has a sort of a similar um, idea behind it. Um, it's called the robe ward um, and its coping mechanisms. And um, it's, again, it's more as if um, this is a treasure trove of artifacts that have been unearthed by a, an archaeologist in the future, maybe 3,200 years in the future. So a future, so like Howard Carter, um, discovering the tomb of Tutankhamun. This archaeologist in the future has um, uncovered this, this cache of artifacts, and they are documenting what is now, but has been lost to the future, because once again, it's disappeared. So it's that idea of us losing things once again. And losing things in the natural world, and uh, so I'm thinking in, in the natural world of plants and animals and human beings? Well, very possibly. <laughs> yeah, very, very possibly. I mean, un unfortunately, um, a lot of the loss is due to us and our um, lack of interest in, in preserving other species other than ourselves. But in the destruction of others, we're destroying ourselves. So it's very ironic. Um, yes. So, and also the loss of ideas and the loss of um, uh, co philosophical concepts. Uh, maybe they, you know, that, that kind of thing too, the loss of wisdom perhaps. Perhaps we're not learning from the past the way we should. So, so that kind of loss as well. But very much the loss of uh, flora, fauna, and habitat. Yeah. So I would like to take one of these uh, pieces, the armor pieces, uh, and, and uh, as with Sam, uh, as to deconstruct it. Okay. Uh, 
Your choice. My choice. Uh, well, uh, how about the feathers? Perfect. Let's, okay. Let's go with that. <laughs> okay. So, this piece is called Fight or Flight uh, for Joan of Arc. So, um, it's came from, I, I go for many walks. I have a little dog. I take him for two walks every day. I walk through the forest. I walk along the beaches. And I just can't stop myself from picking up things. So for many years, I just picked up feathers. And so this was made with my collection of feathers at the time. Um, it's, I, love, I love collecting things either natural things or manufactured things that have been discarded. Um, I mean, these were just, they just fell off birds, but they've still been discarded. I, I love taking those and um, using them to create something, something beautiful and, and, and different with, with meaning. Um, now, I was, the, 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 the going back, just taking a few steps back, the thing with working with found objects is that I have to figure out how I'm going to actually make them work for me. So for me, I don't use glue. I sew everything. So I have to be able to figure out how to attach the found objects to each other, to a backing. And I also want to make them semi, like as permanent as possible, because it's a lot of work has gone into each piece. So um, through trial and error, I figured out a way to uh, successfully attach the feathers. But I also realized that if I didn't preserve them, the moths would get at them. And they would just become moth-eaten within a few months. So I actually do paint them with acrylic medium to, to preserve them. And that deters the, the moths. So that's one aspect that I'm always looking at. How am I going to actually work with this? material. Now, the idea behind this one, um, I, I grew up in the south of England, and one of the places we used to visit was Winchester and Winchester Cathedral. And there is a statue of Joan of Arc in Winchester Cathedral. And it, it's, it dates, I think, from the 20s or 30s. It's a bronze statue. And interestingly enough, the inscription on the base of, like on the plinth, it actually says Joanna Dark. So as a young teenager, I think, oh my goodness, I, maybe I'm Joan of Arc reincarnated, you know. <laughs> so anyway, so that was part of it. Um, I wanted to. Re <laughs> Must have been a moment. <laughs> yes, of course, I, I don't believe that anymore. Anyway, I found a photograph I had taken of that from when I was young, and and used that as my inspiration for this piece. So this is the same shape as the armor she is wearing. Okay. And the feathers um, and the fight or flight, it's just, well, I mean, just imagining, wow, wouldn't it have been amazing if she could just take flight out of the fire and not burn to death? And, uh, but, but also, obviously, I mean, and there's, a, there's a lot more going on in there, going back to the idea of armor and battle and that aspect of the fight or flight mentality. So those are some of the ideas that were going through my head when I was, when I was making that. Do you ever put these on? When you're finished, do you wear them? Well, um, when I first started making them, I sort of made them so they couldn't be put on. But now, now I make them so they could be. For instance, the one we were just talking about, the head the opening, the neck opening, is That's too small. You couldn't put your head through it. Oh, and I, did, I don't have a back slit. So this one cannot be worn without being um, altered in some way. This one has a bigger opening. That one could be slipped over one's head. And this one has an opening in the back. That one could be worn, too. Okay, so, <laughs> yeah. so I actually don't. Yeah. I, don't I don't wear them. They're, yeah. they're a little bit fragile. Uh, but um, my also make medieval copes, and I have a, I've been making those for about the same length of time, about 20 years. And some of those I've actually uh, worn in the Pender Island. Um, we call it Zoo Islander, and it's an annual fashion, sort of non-fashion show where 
people. Uh, I believe you have a similar one here. We used to, yeah. Yes, yeah, so, so I have worn some of my copes in those. Uh -huh. Um, which and has been fun. About this piece here, so and the button, yeah, those yes. are the, the two copes yeah. that are in the show, right. yes. Right. Um, Unbeknownst to me, I had no idea that these, uh, the, uh, you know, the texture on these uh, uh, scarves or these capes um, were really uh, dot, dash, dash, dot, dot, dot. And so it was my husband accompanying me last evening. He knows Morse code. We spoke about that. And he said, what's Morse code? <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, I, I was fascinated by that. Could you speak a little bit about the, uh, that element? And then also, what is behind? What is this trying to tell us? Yep. Please. Well, more, I've, I'm absolutely fascinated with Morse code. Um, I'm, I don't know why it, the, um, the way it's visually presented with series of combinations of dots and dashes, I find um, fascinating because you can, you can write out a phrase, you have the dots and dashes and immediately you have a pattern, but it's, it's a pattern that's been generated by the letters and the words rather than one that I've generated. So it's a, it, the way it looks is more organic. I find often if I'm, it's very hard to come up with something that doesn't look organized. And this is a way, it's like I'm not, I'm not creating this pattern. The words are creating the pattern and I love that idea. And I, was, I had some wood blocks that I'd made of stylized dots and dashes and I was doing block printing with them just, to, just as, a, as decoration and not telling anyone what, what they actually were. And then as I was doing that, I just thought, oh, I should try and find out how to weave with Morse code because it just seemed that was the next, the logical next step. So um, once I'd figured that out, I had to kind of excavate my loom out of storage and it got covered up because I hadn't woven in years. And, um, and, and also I had to figure out how I was actually going to achieve it. So I found uh, an old weaving pattern called summer and winter weave. It used to be woven, um, used to weave coverlets. It was popular in eastern Canada in the 1800s. It's called summer and winter because it works with two blocks, usually one light, one dark, um, and you create the, the pattern using these binary blocks. So it, was the, it just seemed the perfect pattern for me to translate into Morse code. So I use one set of blocks as the dots and dashes and the other set of blocks as the spaces in between. So I'm working with A blocks and B blocks. Um, and then I can then, um, I, I have my phrase, I can translate it into Morse code, and then when I am setting up the pattern on the loom, I'm setting up the blocks on, to represent those, the, those two sets of blocks, mm -hmm. representing the, the message and the, the in-between, yeah. So this says each slow dusk. Yes. What does, what does that mean? Okay, so that is actually the first part of the last line of a poem by Wilfred Owen called Anthem for Doomed Youth. So he was one of the war poets um, from the First World War. He did go to the trenches. Um, he survived for a while but he didn't survive the war. He was killed in the trenches, but he wrote poems about his experiences. So that last line of the poem is, each slow dusk, a drawing down of blinds. It's, it's, an, it's a very powerful poem. Mm -hmm. What was the name of the poem? Anthem for Doomed Youth. So all, all but two of the phrase of the titles of the weavings are taken from poems and those 
So um, the other two I have Save Our Souls, and I wanted that because if any of us know Morse code, we know the SOS, dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, dot, dot. So I wanted the Save Our Souls for that reason. So it would be a, it would be a way of drawing people in to the idea of Morse code. But I have, you know, for instance, Fade Far Away over there is from Ode to a Nightingale by Keats. Um, and so um, I chose my phrases very, very carefully um, because to me, what I wanted these phrases to be, I wanted them to be it's as if these were the things, the last phrases that are endangered species could be silently screaming as they go extinct. And so we don't hear them screaming, and we can't read these messages because we don't understand Morse code. So it's that whole idea of that message being lost, no matter how much it's repeated, because it, the message is woven once across, but it's actually repeated five times throughout the length of the weaving, because this particular pattern, as you're weaving, you weave the pattern that you've set up going across the loom, so you can read it both ways. And is this the separating yes, part here? Yes, it is, so and that is, numbers. yeah, yeah. I see, I see. Uh, so when I learned about this, <clears throat> one of the things that I thought immediately was, here is this wrap, or something that I can actually wrap myself and be surrounded with warmth, with beauty, and yet this message is melancholy. It's very sad. It is sad. Yeah. Um, yes. Now, there is one of them is I Will Arise, uh -huh. which is from um, the Lake Olive Industry by, by Yates. And that was the only, that's Unfortunately, the only positive, but there, is, but it is there. There is that. Like there, um, there is still a chance for, for us to take action, for us to save some of the, yeah. 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 So we're we're going to be the dozens. Uh, we're going to be touring children, and I would, I think children are just going to really be fascinated. Uh, by this Morse code, and I, I, they may not know Morse, Morse code, but they, they know what it is. And so to, in order to translate that into a beautiful piece of art, uh, and then uh, have them understand um, that, you know, the, the similarities and the dichotomies and, and what the artist is you know, trying to say with the piece, I think is going to be uh, really phenomenal. I'm really excited to show this to you. I would love children, and for me, I'm, what I'm hoping is that, yes, they'll be excited about the idea of Morse code, about sol finding clues, solving clues, finding the hidden messages. And I'm really hoping that they, they don't dwell too much on the, on the, the melancholy of yes. the pieces, right. but that they um, embrace the idea of Morse code and maybe even are... Um, want to go home and, and, and find out more about it. And also perhaps are drawn to the colors. Mm -hmm. um, I use natural dyes to dye all the threads. And, now, and, and I think that that again is very important to use natural dyes rather than synthetically produced dyes. And I think, I mean, you get beautiful colors. Mm -hmm. I mean, they just shine, they're just gorgeous. So I would really like the children to um, to respond to the colors as well, yes. And to the idea of weaving, and that it's not an ancient thing or, or even a mechanized mm -hmm. process, that it can be done now and by hand. And the reason I brought this in here to, to look, this is uh, for me just so colorful and you know, uh, so involved. Uh, first of all, do, do tell us about the title and, and what it is that prompted you uh, to do this book. Oh, this is. <laughs> yeah, well, um, it's called, I call it Horror Vacui, uh, just the fear of empty spaces. Um, and um, that phrase ha is applied to different um, art from different periods, different medium. 
artists, but I think of it in the context of medieval tapestries, when every little bit of the surface was covered, maybe with a myriad flowers, but, but that's the context that I think of that in. Um, I, it's inspired by many, many things. I, I had my own button collection, because you never know when you're going to need a button. <laughs> and um, not that I ever did, but I had my button collection just in case. And um, I used to, when I was a kid, I used to love playing with my mother's button collection and sorting them into color and size. Um, and I found from talking to other people that many of us share that experience. Um, when I, I wanted, this is one of my medieval copes, so part of the other series that I've been making in conjunction with the armor. So the shape is inspired by a cope. Um, the, the buttons, well, I should say that I didn't have enough buttons. So I put out a call and I got six button collections donated to me from the lovely people of Pender Island. So I, I need to thank them and think of them every time I look at this piece. Um, I started it just before COVID and I finished it last year. Um, no, wait, I finished it this year. <laughs> I finished it just before it was shown on Salt Spring as part of our show there. So it was a really long process. The buttons are all hand sewn on to the backing, um, which is very, very time consuming, but it's lovely because it's meditative and you just get to look at every single button as you attach it. So the, the two, two ideas behind it, I was thinking of, it was COVID, I was thinking of the pictures of viruses under microscopes and thinking of this as a microscopic image. But I was also looking at images from the James Webb telescope. And I was thinking that this could also be uh, galaxies. So it's that tiny versus vast kind of scale that I was trying to combine in the piece. Oh, but, and one last thing I'd really, really like to say is the idea of buttons is very close to my heart. My, my parents grew up in Birmingham in England, and the button industry there was one of the very important industries. So uh, the idea of buttons and button making and Birmingham, I find, like, like having those all intertwined, I, I find really, really um, inspirational. So, yeah. Great. Thank you. We're going to open now to a couple of questions. Yes. So, if you would. So, I have a question about the piece over here with the bottles. Oh, yes. And I believe it's called Empty Promises. Yes. Which then led me to wonder, why are the bottles stoppered? Oh, yes. That, now, that is a really good question. Thank you. Uh, I hadn't even thought of why. I, I, in my mind, I needed to put stoppers in them. Um, maybe to, huh. That's okay, it'll be a question no, we'll use on tours. No, I think that that's fascinating. No one has ever asked me that, but now I'm thinking about it and I'm thinking, empty promises. Hmm, you don't want those to, you know, you don't want those to, to escape, right? So I guess they're being contained. For me, though, I use those bottles a lot. Now, often, I have never, this is the only piece where I've used them empty. The other pieces, I have filled them with little tiny things and stoppered them. So I think I was just going with that thing of needing to put the corks in them because that's what I always do. But your comment on you don't want them to escape, immediately my brain went to Pandora's box. Oh, right. So maybe that's, yeah. So maybe, so I, well, I like that reading of it very much. Uh, what? <laughs> it's like, yes, I love that. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. And thank you for having us here. It's just a pleasure to be here. And thank you for
bringing your work down from Salt Spring Island. Oh yeah, that was Richard and Patrick drove it down. Like amazing okay. duo. Okay. But yeah, it's lovely to be here, and as everyone has mentioned, we're so happy and so impressed with the gallery. Oh, good. It's, it's a great experience. Well, uh, looking at all the pieces that you brought to uh, us, um, I'm wondering if we could start with this piece here, and the title is uh, very interesting. Nothing uh, is indifferent to us, and so there are multiple layers. There are two layers here that I see, and, and you know, being in a museum, we're not we're not going to touch this. But I would love it if you would maybe show us the back, okay. so our viewers are not tempted. <laughs> so not here they will be anyway. <laughs> if you could do that and just talk to us a little bit about what's going on with the imagery and how it is how you're translating it from tapestry to what we see. Sure, um, I'll do my best. Uh, yeah, nothing is indifferent to us. It's part of a series. There are some other pieces in the other room in that series. Um, and in the name, implication is that nothing in the natural world is indifferent to our influence anymore. Um, and uh, that relationship has fueled my work for quite a while, the impact of human activity and what that means in the environment, sometimes positive, but often quite destructive. And uh, interesting to me. I'm interested in that kind of uh, mess. Um, so yeah, this piece is, was uh, an earlier piece um, and it's wall-based. All the other pieces in the exhibition are dimensional or have a dimensional or draped element and I think that was partly my desire to try something new in the latter stages of my career to experiment with draping and shaping the works. But even this one I think has a kind of engagement of the two layers and one layer is hidden, and I want it to be hidden because it's, the piece is called Veil as well. Mm -hmm. it, in the back image, is veiled. Um, it, you can peer in and around, but you can't see the uh, entire image, which, if I lift this up, you can see is smokestacks and smoke oh. and mm -hmm. pollution, industrial pollution. I'm drawn to things right now that are about the abused environment. But I render them, I, I think, quite beautifully. And maybe that's my desire to create hope, is that the images are often quite beautiful. Mm -hmm. I, I think they're beautiful. Um, and that maybe is that little window that, that uh, Joanna talked about, of finding a way to create hope. The idea is acid rain. My work is always very stylized. I'm not interested in, the, in an explicit statement. Mm -hmm. I'd like people to interpret. I think interpretation in the arts is a very, very creative act that, that, inv that involves the viewer. So the viewer can feel very much part of the work because they're drawn to interpret. So yeah, sort of acid rain, this was taken from a fish kill in, the, um, in Canada recently. And ideas of rust, the rusting of uh, surfaces. I use rust a lot, it's a uh, you know, surface that's been impacted by nature and then has reacted. And of course, on the veiled image behind. So this is, and I've placed, I've used a lot of metal in, metal supports and metal in these pieces again to bring in a, a kind of heavier um, industrial element, um, which is something I'm quite interested in looking at right now. So yeah, I think this one is fairly explicit compared to my other works, which I think are a little bit more cryptic. Um, which is more the direction I'm going right now. But I am interested in pattern and translating things from the environment into a very pattern-oriented surface. Does that sound well, You know, just speaking with the process and looking at um, the weaving, how you attained, I, I, I think, um, such uh, intricate uh, imagery I mean, those are obviously fish, and to me, anyway, they're obviously fish, they're obviously dead, mm -hmm. and um, so, well, not, yeah, yeah, to me, they're obviously dead, but the, the intricacy of how you're weaving um, is, uh, what you're weaving is, um, tr is truly masterful. So, I'd like to maybe turn towards sure. these pieces sure. here. Okay, so these pieces are draped, and I'm interested in the in the idea of tapestry being draped. It's often flat to the wall like a painting and it's often referred to as being painterly, which always makes me a bit crazy. 
Um, but yeah, the idea of a draped, I mean, and, and also I think of tapestry always as a textile. And I'm interested in the history of textile, which is so closely tied to who we are as, as humans. So I'm, I'm always looking for that link. And I think that by draping the works, I'm drawing that in. And I'm extremely interested in pattern, the idea of translating the natural world into pattern, which is something we've done for forever. The natural world has been a source for patterning. Um, but our natural world has changed considerably. So I'm interested in creating patterns that reflect those changes. So each work I've used pattern from an abused landscape um, as the source. There, uh, I'll, I'll explain each one and then it kind of it's some general statement. So uh, desertification, where drought turns land into a desert. With this one little band of um, kind of greenery left. Deforestation, um, it's a palm, the end of a forest turning into uh, palm uh, oil production, the side of an open pit mine, the sort of excavation of a mine, and an image of um, the tar sands and an oil spill on the palm um, piece. And I've chosen this, the, the piece is called Inheritance, um, and these pieces are remnants, remnant one to four, um, a remnant suggesting the idea of a fragment of a garment. And I've using, I'm using this idea of the garment in a lot of my works right now um, because I think the garment stands in for us. It is a surrogate, in a way, for the human body. And always I'm looking to try and make some kind of connection between human activity and us. Negative, positive. But there is an, there is an interaction that's happening. It's a kind of conversation. So I'm suggesting the garment. They would never be worn. I don't want them to be worn because then I'd lose the symbolism. I want them to always, I want the garment to be a symbol, not a something specific that you would, you would put on. So they're sized oddly and they're fragments, they're bits and pieces. But I hope that in looking at them, the viewer gets a sense of the body. It's more explicit in some of my other works, but that it, the body and us, our complicity in these environments, hovers there in the, in the idea that that is part of the statement. And, um, yeah. So you're bringing in the human element, you're, you're uh, saying, uh, to my way of thinking, you're saying to us that this is what we're doing. And this is, this is um, uh, something that um, could we have done it better? For sure. I mean, I, mean, I think, I don't like to think of my works as political, and I don't like to think that I'm trying to tell anyone how to think. Often they're about my own confusion and mm -hmm. how perplexed I am by what's happening in the world and mm -hmm. researching to try and find order, which you never do. It just gets more perplexing. Mm -hmm. And I've, been a, I've, I've explored a number of subject matters, everything from cloning to genetic modification, things that I find are, I and mean, AI now would be maybe another subject matter, mm -hmm. things that are, that originated because of us that are changing the world around us. And I, I just don't quite know how to put it all in context. And I think I use my work personally to delve into that. And then I guess I do hope that it draws people in to interpret, as I mentioned before, that wonderful act of interpretation that is so important in the way we approach our work, and draw their own conclusions. Now, I mean, if they drew conclusions completely differently, <laughs> I might be a little annoyed, but, um, you know, once you've made a work, it's out there, there's nothing you can do, and right. this, it really is more about my own concerns than trying to say you must feel this way about the environment. Um, although I hope it suggests things, and I, I think, you know, textiles, saw this in Joanna's work too, they're, they're a very rich surface. They draw you in. There's an intimacy about them. Um, and I, I want that. I want people to become really engaged with the surface, both at a distance, the overall view of the work, plus the detailing of the small amounts. I'm really interested in detail. I think that using detail in work adds a kind of authority. The way you might add detail in a novel to really flesh out a character or an environment, I like detail. I want people to get close, really not to handle them, but to get up close and intimate with the work so that you create an intimate bond between the viewer 
And in doing that, I think you can encourage this idea of, of uh, interpretation. Mm -hmm. um, so um, this, I think, is another uh, great uh, example of what to show children and to bring out um, the, the human uh, connection with tapestry. Mm -hmm. And we, last night, uh, we were talking about, you were telling me about tapestries from ancient times mm -hmm. and um, you know what they what they did what they said and and um, then I see these pieces here which really it looks like someone came in had been wearing and hung it on a hook mm -hmm. and so there was that very human element mm -hmm. not just because there's a sleeve here and I think maybe a sleeve here and it had once been worn mm -hmm. um, Anyway, I think that being able to introduce children to uh, an idea of uh, the other side of tapestry, since we're all familiar with, with, with tapestries and, and do they say something to us or are they just pretty pictures or what have you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, historically, tapestries were all about narrative. And I think my work is, there is narrative, but it is that more abstract approach to, to narrative. There is an idea and a source and a reading but it's a little bit more open to interpretation than the tradition. Mm -hmm. But it's the same technique. It's not the same. Uh, technique. So I don't know if we want to go into the other room, but um, I, I would love to just look at um, the, the pieces there. I think there are two pieces. Um, yeah, the dresses. I'd love to talk about the two dresses. Yeah, please. That's They're too ongoing good. right now. Yeah, um, the Heretic series, uh, the, the other pieces in the other room, and these uh, are part of a, an ongoing series. Um, and again, there's the garment reference. In this case, they're child size. Uh, hopefully that comes across. They maybe look a little bit more clearly like a garment, but again, not wearable. They're a symbol. Um, and again, this idea of a kind of interaction between human activity and the natural world um, and patterning, looking for sources of pattern. Um, both use the idea of rusted surfaces, um, uh, and these come from um, doing lots of photographs and exploring of industrial sites right now, and um, crushed cars, and uh, in my more recent ones, old dairies, old canneries, parts of industrial areas that are falling into disuse and decay. So I'm interested in human activity and how we're creating this trail of things that are no longer useful, that uh, are abandoned, um, and what that means in the future. Now, in some cases, the natural world starts to reassert itself in some ways with lichen, moss, mold, um, things that start a kind of conversation back and forth between abused surfaces and the regeneration of the natural world. So these are patterned with areas of rust from industrial sites. Images come from industrial sites. Moss, lichen, uh, mold, black mold, um, that sort of form this conversation back and forth. I I've chosen to make them child size to suggest the idea of inheritance. What, what are we leaving for the next generation? I think it's on the minds of so many people and what will this conversation, this engagement between the natural world and human activity, what form will it take as we move forward? Will there even be, will it be more decay? I mean, all of the cars that will, if we transfer to electric cars, all of the crushed cars and that garbage, what, <laughs> what kind of a legacy, I guess, what kind of an inheritance is that for, for our children? Um, yeah, I don't know, but I, I'm perplexed by these things, and I, I like to try and work through those in my work. And again, I, they're very colorful. I think they're still quite beautiful. I use color because I love it. It's a passion. It gets me through a very arduous process to work with color and play with it. And the, the idea of pattern and detail. And I, I think, too, I'm, as a subtext in my work, there's always the idea of the handmade. I think that the handmaid is, is important, particularly as we move into uh, such a technology-driven uh, culture, AI. So many things are removing us from what has in the past made us distinctly human, our ability to use our hands and our mind in sequence, in, in unison, 
to create, to create beautiful things, to develop technology. So I want to draw people in always to the idea of the handmaid in my work, and that the handmaid, the idea that each stitch is a hand process, is important to me. Um, and I think it, there's something about the handmaid that draws you up close, it's intimate, it suggests the involvement of the maker uh, in that kind of conversation. And I think it demands that you look closely and you pay attention. And I guess I see that our relationship with the natural world should involve those things. We should be looking closely and we should be paying attention. So in a very symbolic way, I try to embody that within these pieces to draw people into that kind of um, commitment to look closely and pay attention. Pay attention to the legacy that we're leaving. Yeah, the legacy to the world around us and what's happening. Yeah. To not just disregard it, mm -hmm. to be indifferent. Jane, thank you so much. Oh, my, my so pleasure. It's just been lovely. so lovely to speak with you, to have you go through, uh, as with all the other artists um, today. Uh, I'm so um, grateful that you're taking the time to explain your work and everybody else. Oh, you know, artists, we love to talk about our work. <laughs> well, that's a good thing. And, and we're the, the wiser for it. Um, very much so. Yeah. And thank you. That's been great. Okay. Happy to have a little question. Yeah. Let's go. Okay, John, welcome. Hi. And, uh, wow, you're in uh, our beautiful Nichols Gallery, and you've got these four uh, paintings that really are making quite a show here. The, the size, uh, of course, the uh, fantastic application of paint, as far as I'm concerned. And we talked a little bit about that yesterday. And so we're going to start with this piece. And then I'd like you to tell us a little bit about not just the process that you go through, but what's behind the, the um, linking of paint to canvas. And I think this is not canvas. This is board, yes? These are boards. Yeah, this is, uh, this is retrieved uh, plywood that I uh, picked up at our uh, local uh, garbage dump on Salt Spring Island. I was... Uh, of the recycling. I, uh, well, it was partially about that, but mostly I, I was just getting rid of my garbage and, and was driving out, and I looked over, and they had plywood sitting there with glue all over it. And the glue, I just thought, oh, that looks so beautiful. It's like going down a street and you see the tar marks on the, on the road that uh, someone's done. And some people are very good at that. They make these beautiful tar marks. So I was looking at these beautiful glue marks and I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab those and, and use them. I, I wasn't, though, thinking that practically about something like this because this probably weighs three or 400 pounds. So when, once you make it, you have to store it. You have to transport it. You have to do all these types of things. So, this uh, ended up being uh, an image that I, I used the, the glue marked side. The other side's a little bit better. And I wanted to have it as sort of the inside, because at, at one time the glue marks and the pieces of paper or whatnot would have been the inside of a wall. So I wanted it to be an exposing uh, aspect to it. And so I, I sized it all up and, and uh, started working on it. And, um, I, uh, it's actually a portrait of my father who passed away, or sorry, my mother passed away uh, three years ago. So I did a portrait of my father, and uh, he's been having a few issues after my mother passed away. He hasn't really recovered from that. So, uh, and then also he's been having some emotional things that are coming up as well. So these are, these are very personal images for myself, and uh, I just felt like I needed to convey that, because I, I ob obviously as well was going through a lot of uh, grief and um, and different things at that time as well. So I started working on this and building it up. Most of my work, uh, even though I try to keep it fresh in a certain way, they take a number of uh, years to complete. I probably worked on this for two years. Uh, some of my other works I've worked on for two or three years. I've worked on pieces up to seven, seven or eight years. And I work on them and I put them away and then I pull them back out again and uh, keep, keep going with it. But uh, there, there, there's a layering here, you know, of all these different textures and images. There's 
there's of course the real the realism mm -hmm. uh, semi realism of the image of your father mm -hmm. and um, and then there's this abstraction of where he is in like maybe a snowstorm through a forest that's right yeah in. yeah and so um, then I'm seeing this you know this added on piece here yeah and that added on yeah. light bulb yeah so uh, we spoke yesterday about this and the the the, the bird image uh, that you put it together. Mm -hmm. um, so, could you also tell me a little bit about that light bulb? Well, the What's light. That light bulb? <clears throat> well, the light bulb. <clears throat> uh, the light bulb is actually uh, it's a portrait of my mother. Uh, her favorite song was "This Little Light of Mine," mm -hmm. and she used to sing this song to me when I was really small. And uh, so I thought, I'm going to put a light bulb in there. It's, it, it's kind of quirky as well. And it's very kind of uh, spontaneous. I wanted these to have a kind of spontaneous feel to them. And uh, even though I might deliberate over these uh, ideas for a long time, uh, but then I'll think, OK, it works or it doesn't work or it's corny. Maybe it's a little bit corny. Some people, you have to be on page with these things. I mean, some people are on page with them. Some people aren't. So it's a, it's a kind of a rarefied thing. I know with the bird, for example, um, uh, having, uh, the original uh, bird that was on this, which was in the Canadian show, was a real eagle that I had been gifted by uh, uh, a fellow who actually was a friend of my father's. And uh, I told him, I said, if, I'm gonna, if I take them from you, I probably will be using them in art. So I used it, and I, I sprayed it with spray snow, and it was, it was there. But of course, you can't bring a real eagle uh, into the United States. So uh, uh, Peter Lane asked me if there's any way of coming up with a, a different idea for it. So I decided to do this substitute eagle. It's made out of arbutus twigs which I put together very quickly with my power nailer, and it took me probably about 15 minutes. And uh, I didn't want to have it too, um, too much like an eagle. I wanted it to look like it was like a, a phantasm or something like that. Maybe you're seeing that, maybe not. Uh, and the top was actually on the original eagle head that I ripped off. So the inside is actually the shell of a real eagle's head, and it's the ghost of that. So that's supposed to replicate snow uh, or, or whatnot on top of an, an eagle's hill and so, uh, head. So I was trying to create with this a feeling of, um, of silence. I wanted this painting to feel silent. And uh, so, you know, I think we all have experienced being out in a snowstorm, and you can feel the snow coming down in a certain way. And it, you know, time can feel a little suspended. So that's what I was trying to do with this. And also create these layers that uh, are obscuring him and pushing him back because his memory is going as well. He's 93. And uh, so it has to do with, with that. And uh, my original, original uh, idea for doing a snow painting came from Peter Bruegel, the elder. He did a, a painting called Hunters in the Snow, which is one of my favorite paintings. So that was the original idea, and I wanted to do a snow painting for 40 years, so I finally have done one. So, uh. All right, okay. yeah. uh, the other thing that I'm noting is, of course, the dark side where the yeah. eagle is um, yeah. being. Uh, can you just say something to that? That that is uh, originally I did that with paint, and it was done in very uh, lean uh, layers of paint. And then afterwards, I thought, you know what, I, it doesn't have the substance I want. And so I uh, I was in the, a hardware store, and they had uh, buckets of roofing tar. And I thought, you know what, I, I'm going to try to use that. So I took it outside and and heated up a board, and then put the roofing tar on it, and and tried to replicate the feeling of tree bark. And so I. It has kind of a gnarly, uh, uh, unappealing kind of quality about it. And that's what I, I try to do with a lot of my work. I try to have things that are uh, not particularly appealing, contrasting with things that are, potentially are appealing. And uh, so I really feel like juxtapositions of light and dark, color uh, versus tone, they energize each other. And uh, so I'm trying to always uh, work with that. Yeah. I like the contrast. 
uh, between the light and the dark, and um, and also too with the image of the scattering of the bird, yeah, uh, or the the uh, the way that you depicted the bird, um, and then of course we figured out what this was here, the barnacle. <laughs> <laughs> I pulled that up. I pulled that up from a beach. Actually, uh, it was a, a ship or a boat that had been. Uh, uh, most of it was gone, but there were shards of metal everywhere. And so I, I just grabbed that. I thought I can use that as a for something. I didn't know what I was going to use it for. So a lot of times I don't know what I'm. I don't necessarily always know what I'm doing. Most my wife will say most of the time you don't know what you're doing. But <laughs> anyhow, it evolves uh, uh, hopefully to something else. Yeah. I don't know if you're, has your dad seen this? What's that? Sorry? Has your dad, dad seen this? He has said this. He has seen this. Yeah. I don't know if he knows what to make of it, actually. He sees it, and uh, I really haven't yeah. explained that much to him about it. Maybe I'm embarrassed to say too much to him about it, or uh, because this is actually... You know, it's funny, you're doing, I'm doing this, and it's actually very... These are all quite personal things, but I don't think about it because I'm in my studio working by myself, it's just me and what I do. And uh, so when it gets out in the world, it's, it's uh, almost like you're, you're, you're very exposed all of a sudden with it. But it's, it's OK. I go to nudist beaches, and so it's, I'm used to it. <laughs> but, but do you create, that leads me to just ask this you know, very simple question. Do you, do you make art um, so others can see it, or do you just make art for yourself? I no, I I hope with everything I do that there's a connection to other people that other it's relative to other people can relate to it uh, through uh, the story I tell or or whatnot. But most of the time I hope like I'm t describing you, to you what this is about. But I I hope that when people come and look at it that they don't they're not relying on those stories or that way of looking at it that, that someone can look at it and take away from it what they think is there. Everybody will think it's something a little bit different. Some people, are, again, are on page with what you say. Some people aren't. And uh, so that's, that's the process I go through. Let's move to the other painting. OK. I've looked at this a few times. And uh, I'm seeing so much more now than I uh, did earlier this morning. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen now the words. Mm -hmm. and of course, the tire, oh, that's there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, so, and of course, I saw the, the uh, human form. And go ahead and talk to well, us I, just a little bit about this. It, you know, it, I, I started off, you start off with an idea. Something usually will hit me at a certain moment in time. Uh, or I'll be confronted by something, being confronted by the plywood at the uh, a garbage dump was a confrontation, you know, there was something there that I saw and I thought, what's going on there? This image started off from myself and my daughter was witnessing a car accident while we were on a road trip. And we were driving through the central part of British Columbia in, uh, there was a lot of forest fires going on. And we came around a corner and I was driving and I kind of swerved a little bit. And I, I didn't realize it at the time, but I was being uh, affected by the smoke. There was a lot of smoke. And how we come around a corner and there's a truck on its side and uh, the fellow gets out and it, and it bursts into flames. And uh, so I didn't depict that specifically, but after that I thought, wow, that's, that's something really interesting for me. So I decided, uh, I'd already taken some photographs on Salt Spring of, of an old uh, uh, place where there's a lot of old cars, so I was taking images of cars or whatnot. So I decided to take that as a starting point and make it into a, a, an image. And then, of course, as I was w going along with it, uh, I'm, I'm making this image, trying to make it compelling somehow. And then uh, there was always things going on in the world, you know, down the states at that time. There's a lot of, and even now, there's a lot of political things going on, right versus left, Democrats versus Republicans. And so I, I was thinking that this was kind of the end of a, ro end of a road somewhere. And um, there's a sign, right or left, you, you only have two choices, and it's been knocked down. And uh, there's this figure here who's, 
kind of like a ghostly figure in a certain way, and he's got a stick and he's pointing at a sign, and you don't know, he's, he's kind of pointing to things, but you don't necessarily know who he is. I wanted him to be kind of enigmatic and, and, uh, and have uh, that aspect to him. But, uh, and then, of course, I <clears throat> put the tire on here as part of it, and, and it was fun because years ago I was uh, at a gallery in Vancouver and Robert Rauschenberg was there. And I was there with uh, my wife and I had my daughter who was about a year and a half old. And she was on my arm. And uh, I saw Robert Rauschenberg and I thought, okay, there's that guy over there. Now, he had a confrontation, a little bit of one. It was just a fun one with Willem de Kooning. Uh, he went to Willem de Kooning's studio one time with a bottle of Jack Daniels and shut the door and he wanted to take one of Willem de Kooning's drawings to erase. And uh, so I thought, okay, there he is. So I walked up to him with my daughter and I said, uh, hello, sir. And shook his hand. He looked at me kind of oddly. And uh, so, uh, and then uh, I was uh, walking around the room and looking at stuff and I came back to him again. I was talking to him and I said, uh, you know, I really, I really love all your, I really love your art, but the, the paintings on the wall weren't uh, his paintings. They were the paintings of his partner. And at that moment, he got a little bit annoyed at me. He w started pacing the room and walked around the room. And he said, he said, these aren't, these aren't my paintings. These are Daryl Portoff's, I think that's his, his partner's name. And I said, uh, I went, oh, I know. And that was the end of it. But uh, anyhow, this is, this is my uh, homage to uh, Robert Rauschenberg as well, who's one of my favorite artists as well. So, um, oh, you thought so. There you go. <laughs> The tire and the goat. The tire and the goat. Yes, and all of all of his other work. Uh, just the, the multimedia and and how he interacts with media and uses different referencing and different ways of working and and it really opened up the whole art practice of using different materials uh, in the 50s and 60s. So yeah. I, when you approach this piece yeah. uh, with the paint, um, the you know I see screening and I see splashes. Yeah. These I, as I call them these kind of art mark. Kind of things, you know? Yeah, yeah. So that just brings in the uh, well. First of all, the the uh, light and dark areas really you know brings the eye around. So that composition, and then the um, art marks or the splashes. You know, yeah. That to me, is just full of energy and full of uh, you know I can say symbolism, but just the energetic. Uh, piece that, that then is this, uh, as I said earlier, the, the reality or realism versus the abstraction. And I, again, there's that dichotomy for me and I, I mm -hmm. find that fascinating. Mm -hmm. I find that mm -hmm. very fascinating. I do, I really, do, I do try to I do try to balance that off. I mean, it's probably hard to see with the camera, but in, in close here, the, the, the paint itself is, is quite thick and I was working in layers. I was, what's that? <laughs> I was scraping my palette off and I just took the beautiful colored areas and stuck, stuck them on here. So there's a little bit of, a little bit of collage here. Uh, this was actually my, my daughter's old tire swing. And when I told her that I'd, I'd cut it down because it was getting a little bit gnarly for uh, uh, doing this installation, she wasn't that happy. But uh, and I also anyhow, see sorry. this piece of canvas down here. It's a piece of canvas. I was doing a bit of a collage, and this is actually, this is actually uh, the back, as with the other painting. This is the back of another painting. There's a painting on the other side that I did in acrylic. Oh. And at a certain point, I actually saw all these beautiful stain marks. So I flipped it around and started working on the back. Um, you know, I like the idea of backwards being forwards and, you know, uh, up is down and uh, it's kind of an element of disorientation or, or not knowing where you are sort of thing. Unfortunately, I, I'm, I'm not good enough as a painter to be able to have kept those uh, stain marks. I ended up having to, I, I end up working things over and over and over again. And um, so uh, that, that has become at a certain point, I thought, okay, it's gone too far, but I thought, no, I'm going to take that working over and just push it to the absolute max. I'm just going to keep going with it as, a, as almost a compulsive thing. So I kept, just kept going with that and, and uh, tried to get a little bit of a kind of an energy out of, of that way of 
thinking, which is probably not a healthy way of thinking, but anyhow, that's, that's how I went about it for, for this piece. So, yeah. Thank you, Joe. Thank you very it's much. Been such a pleasure. It's a wonderful museum here, and thank you very much. You've been all so wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions for John that uh, we can just quickly? Could you say a word or two about the deer? This looks so much like where we live. Yes. I'd love to hear you say what your inspiration was for the emerging deer. The emerging deer. This started from another experience I had. I, you know, I we live on I live on Salt Spring Island, and I. Uh, uh, I came out of my studio one day, and there were two deer, uh, and they were standing in, in exactly the same pose. One was slightly behind the other one, and that at a certain moment in time, the one that was behind started to move off, and the other one in front moved off at exactly the same time, like they were in sync, and they walked in exactly the same sync across. So I was very fascinated by that. So that was the starting point for this particular image. Um, at a certain point as well, I. You know, I'm working along on it, and uh, uh, I usually work, uh, I don't work from, I mean, I, had photog I have photographs of deer, but uh, with all my paintings, I might have a photograph of a figure, but I don't do, I don't do preliminary sketches or anything like that. I invent everything on the, ca on the canvas as I'm working. Um, so uh, at a certain point, I decided, you know, I, I like that idea of them walking off, but then I thought, you know, you know, deer on Salt Spring don't have any tags on them. You know, a lot of animals are tagged, and to to you know reference where they're from or the the, the date or something like that. So I decided to put tags on them, and I, and I was thinking about you know just systems generally and how things are tracked. We're all being tracked. Everything's being tracked, and the deer are being tracked. Even though there, it seems like it's a natural image, it's it's not really. So uh, and then the the leaves, the maple leaves here, were directly out my window. I, I uh, started painting out my window, and then uh, I'm a little bit lazy sometimes when I'm painting. So I I went out and pulled leaves off the trees and put them in and then painted around them and got the leaves up there. And then I discovered that the leaves have a perspective to them. There's usually one side of a leaf is a little bigger than the other. And if you really look, they look like they're in perspective. So I, I took some and, and put them on, and they dif they're different scales as well. Some are bigger and some are very small. So I thought, well, can you put the small ones behind? And that looks like they're far off, and I can have the uh, bigger ones forward, and uh, they're, they're closer. So, so anyhow, this is another piece that I just worked up lots of layers, worked over top of it. Uh, um, at a certain point, it was very real in a certain way, but then I thought the realism wasn't working for me, so I thought I had to make it much more abstract, much more about paint, and then all of a sudden it felt more real by taking the realism away. So, uh, but anyhow, this this yeah, this is also on uh, um, this is on door skin actually, but but uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Else? Thank you very much. Yeah. Great. Good to be here with you and yeah. to see this incredible uh, installation that you've got going. And I know that you're going to show us a few things of some of the uh, ways in which you have put these uh, beautiful pieces together. But then I'd also like us uh, to move out and about. Okay. All right. Well, tell us first of all, um, each, uh, tell us about these uh, crafts that we're looking at, the boats. So the boats are um, Grand Bank dories. They are the traditional fishing boats that uh, were used for cod fishing on the East Coast. They would be stacked inside of the schooner and that they'd go out to the fishing grounds in the Grand Banks, and then each boat would be dropped with the fishermen under sail, and they would uh, catch the cod and then head back to the mothership. The reason I chose these um, boats is because that fishery is now extinct. It no longer exists. It fed millions of people for hundreds of years. And um, it's not—it's not there anymore. 
And so now you've used these as a vehicle for the pieces that you've inserted. So they, they are carrying the detritus of our everyday life that I have, um, I started sewing fabric around the single use plastic that was, came through my, my life and then people found out that I was doing this and bags would appear and people would say, here is mine. I'm just thinking, I produce enough. <laughs> but after doing it for about a year, I found out that what I was doing was enshrouding. It wasn't just sewing fabric around it. And enshrouding was how we would prepare our loved ones for burial. So what I, so I'm just going to go back and just say what happens in my work is that I will have questions, and as I the answers are given to me while I'm working, of course more questions come up. But that's a little bit how I I come to have understanding. And the question I was carrying around when I began this process was, how do we make decisions that take into account consequences? And are we able to actually consider consequences when we make decisions? Or is it that we're just not deciding anything and we're just letting things happen? So I, by in shrouding, I realized what I was doing was individuating each piece. I'm allowed to do this because I made this. So each piece, this was vinegar or antifreeze for the car. It would have been the product that was taken to market would have lasted maybe two days to maybe two months if it was vinegar. But this, this object will last hundreds of years. It will last longer than my granddaughter's children. So this is a body that we created, and we have to take into account what was required to make it, how we extracted the resource, the manufacturing process, taking it to market, and then the fact that this doesn't disappear. So. I think we just should not have any more plastic. No. So I think by individuating each one, we can maybe take those, um, those facts into account. Of enshrouding them and knowing what that meant a few hundred years ago, 800 years ago, for the body of a human being, shrouding the body. Well, it still happens in some yes, cultures. It does. So, it does. Yes, it yeah. does. And um, so that whole element then gives us the pretty much the story, um, part of the story behind what you're, yes. you're trying yeah. to tell us. And each time I finish a piece, I think of it as a prayer is not the right word, but I don't know what the right word is, that this will take us one piece to the end of our plastic era. So it's one step closer to being the end. Otherwise, it is so soulless. This work is so soulless. Hmm. But it's not. It's, it is, it is, it is, it is, but it's necessary. These, these items don't have soul. I also in Shroud's discarded small appliances, remote controls have soul. Sometimes they, I get a, an old remote control and that person was like a huge football fan and I just go, wow, you watched a lot of football. Uh -huh. So there is soul in those pieces. Toasters that were used, they have, they were used. They, they, I still didn't them. Mm -hmm. This is the hardest. Physically the easiest, but it's soulless work. Mm. Do you want to take us also through um, what you've written on the wall? Okay. Um, and, well, yeah, let's, could we go through that? Sure. I really thought that um, I was taken by the words of what you're saying. And, and I think maybe yesterday you were telling me a little bit about the 
background of those words? Okay, so um, how, are, we, are you talking, asking about process or the actual meaning? Let's go through the process first. Okay, okay. I think okay. people are going to want to really know that. And then let's go through that meaning. Okay, yeah. so the process, so how I physically do it, I am recreating, I recreate pre-plastic electrical wiring. So I was struck by the fact that we actually had electricity in our homes before we had plastic. So there are many things that we think are plastic reliant and they're not. If we could have, bring electricity into our homes and have light and all of those things, before there was plastic, we can do it after plastic. So I am recreating knob and tube wiring by taking sash cord and putting stainless steel wire through. And yeah, that's, it, this is not gonna mean that much, but anyway, so, so that's, and then I, I um, create the words and I sew the, the letters in place. Then I create, uh, make a super saturated salt solution and I put these in there and the salt grows and it's completely uncontrollable. So there's, <laughs> anyway, sometimes it takes a few hours, sometimes it takes days, sometimes I have to do them five times, but it is, I am not in control. So how does the salt relate to the... Uh... So this for me is a very sad but optimistic piece in that I, we talked about the salt book, Salt by Mark Kurlansky. Who knew you could read a whole book about salt? Well, I did. And so what he said was that 150 years ago, it was believed that our civilization was going to collapse because it was believed we were running out of salt. And salt was how we preserved our food. Without salt, we would starve in the winter. Well, salt and salt truly was worth its weight in gold, and I remember learning that, and it's a saying in your head, but it doesn't mean anything if you're throwing salt on the road. So salt was worth its weight in gold, now we throw salt on the roads, and I think, wow, people were worried about everything disappearing, and now we're taking that resource and we just throw it on the roads and cause problems. And then, I also was doing research into whales and whaling, and we used to kill whales, and we used their fat to light our homes. So those are things that you know, but you don't feel. At least I knew it, but I didn't really realize what that meant. And I just thought, wow, it must have been very smelly. <laughs> and so I was thinking, in the future, Will we forget that we once fought wars for petroleum? Will we be so past petroleum that we'll have forgotten that we fought wars for it just the way that we killed whales that we forget and we forget that what it meant to have salt worth its weight in gold? Will we forget that and that we used to make plastic, single-use plastic containers, or we just burnt it? And I am hoping we're still around 200 years from now when people were going, those crazy people, what were they thinking? Burning petroleum and making single-use plastic because by then they'll understand the preciousness of this resource that we're just throwing away and destroying the planet. So uh, could you um, take us through, because um, what I found fascinating also, too, was the creation of the dories and how you came to uh, make these dories and, of course, explain what they're, you know, they could tell. Okay. Yeah. So I was given, uh, I'm not actually allowed to tell you who gave me the birch bark, but I managed to divert it from the landfill. And when I was given these, this birch bark. It wasn't because I need this birch bark to make dories. It was just, I didn't want it to go to the landfill. And so, but they, they, they the birch bark told me what they what it wanted and they wanted this. So it's not like I'm going, what am I gonna do with it? It's just sort of just 
appeared in my mind, and so okay. Took me six years to find a boat builder who would agree to making traditional wooden boats that would then have hundreds of holes drilled in it and never float in water. That was something that boat builders had a hard time getting their heads around, but I found this very lovely man, Thomas, who did it. And then so the birch bark came in 12 inch by 12 inch squares and I cut them up and then attached them and drilled the holes and sewed them on. Also, for many years I didn't know the names of the boats and and then they told me that they, well, they it was sort of like, it's so obvious there's a boat for every ocean. I go, okay, well, thank you for telling me. <laughs> it takes time. Mm -hmm. And so um, each boat has its name carved in through the birch bark. And I had to figure out how to sew it. So uh, I think I'll do this one last. Each, so from the outside, they look the same. But in the inside, they have their own pattern, which I came to understand is a different language. So this is Atlantic, and this is Pacific, and then, no, no, Atlantic, Arctic, and Pacific is a hybrid of the two. So they're all dialects of ocean, and that's how they're sewn on. Each one there, and, and so how did you how did you come up with that? How did you come across that? They just I don't I don't come across anything. I just it's like tripping over rocks on the road, and, and I go, of course, that's right. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, and then they're sewn on with seine twine, which is what cotton seine twine, which is what fishing nets were made out of previously, and it's a particularly tight twist on the on the spinning of the of the of the making of the um, string so that it can withstand being pulled up over the gunnels and the beauty of cotton fishing nets is that if it gets lost it will just rot whereas the plastic ones don't and then I um, ran I've waxed them with beeswax so that it it holds the shape so in today's fishing industry, um, I don't. Are they using uh, cotton? No. 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 We, weavers. Cotton. Weavers use cotton seine twine. Uh -huh. But not the fishing. People. No. 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 Fishing. And the fishing people are not making nets by hand. Well, maybe yeah. in some places. Yeah. And I learned how to make nets from a lovely man in Louisiana on YouTube. What a resource. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so. So, um, I guess bringing children, because I've asked a few of the other artists about bringing children through the pieces here. What would you like those children to take away? Or well, even adults. But, but anyone, anyone, I would like them to know that people are thinking about this and people care. Mm -hmm. I think if you feel like you are alone in your anxiety, then that's hard, it's a harder burden. Mm -hmm. If, um, yeah, so if, and people care enough to do crazy work like this, like this is nuts. I would not recommend this to anybody, but it's just like if you get asked to do it, and if you don't do it, then, then you just feel terrible. So you feel you're doing something. I feel like I'm doing something. Um, and then everybody has to do what they can do. And, and then we just listen. We listen and then we're told what to do. Like I don't look, go looking for salt and electrical wiring, like it's all crazy stuff, but it just, okay, this is what you're gonna do now, okay. And I wish they would send more instructions, whoever it is that's asking me to do this, but <laughs> you cannot, you can't YouTube like, oh, how do you do this? But um, so we just listen because we are being given hints on how to get past this. And if we listen and act, 
then maybe we'll come a little bit more into harmony instead of pushing away. So there is um, that just last phrase that you just gave us. There is this um, underlying hope of being able to uh, yeah. come out of this. Yeah. So do you know what this is? Yeah, it looks like a spark. Yeah, this is a future artifact. Future artifact. And we just have to get there close, faster. Let's get to this being like the rotary phone or the horseshoe. Well, the horseshoe still gets used a bit. What is or, that made of? I don't want to tell you. <laughs> it's it's actually was 3D plastic printed. Okay. I need. I'm. That's my next project. Uh -huh. So I need to make molds, and so I yeah. I had it printed so I could make molds. Uh -huh. But this is my hope for the future. Yeah. Thank you. So oh, much my pleasure. For bringing this and in. thank you to the museum for creating this opportunity. No. So one of the things that I've, I've looked at your work online that you've you know, produced, my mother was uh, dressed as a maker, designer, and she would sit at night because she had a day job. And she would sit, she was supporting two children. She had a day job. But at night, she would sit and stitch. And yeah. so, and you know, I, 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 there's something about that that I, I, I never learned how to, you know, sew anything. She was a little. I'll teach you. <laughs> One stitch at a time, darling. Okay. <laughs> you can help me. Anybody wants to help do this, I will teach you how to do it, and you can contribute. I can imagine. Yes, you can. Yeah, all this work. Uh, well, you, can, you can do it. Anyone can do it. It's, it takes a tremendous amount of patience and a lot of heart into it. So. Actually, it's very meditative, yeah. meditative and yeah. soothing. So it soothes that anxiety that we carry about this. So once again, if you do something, it helps. Thank you for helping. Okay. <laughs> okay. No, it helps me. <laughs> okay.